All right, Jenny, have you got just the girl's picture? Okay. There we go. Always ask that question because sometimes my screens get flip-flopped. All right, well, if uh, tonight is anyone's first night joining us, we welcome you to our Monday musings. Um, I want to apologize there for last week. I bit off a little bit more than I could chew, and there was just a few things I had to put on the back burner. So uh, we'll make that up probably after the first of the year. Uh, no, I'm calling you. Uh-oh. Hey, just as a reminder, everybody, just make sure you're muted. And if we do ask questions or anything, flip that in the chat box. Jenny is, is our co-host, so she's going to be managing that tonight as we go along. So if you have any issues, just feel free to, to pop those in there for her because I can't see that share, uh, chat screen when I'm actually uh, in presentation mode. Uh, but anyway, uh, we will do the virtual hike on the AT probably sometime after the first of the year because I know most people don't want to be doing classes in December so our last class is November 30th so we'll just take a break for December and, and come back in in January and do that so um, again welcome to tonight uh, we're going to be covering our Appalachian woodland species so if you joined us a few weeks ago on um, exploring the Appalachian region this is kind of piggybacking off of that and next week we're going to be talking about native um, Appalachian plants and we're going to be talking about edibles in a few weeks we're going to talk about some unique uses for herbs and then of course we've got the Appalachian folklore in some order there coming up uh, between now and November 30th so make sure you join with us because all these kind of go hand in hand together so to jump in for tonight, we're going to be talking about uh, specifically woodlands. And that, of course, is where our trees are going to be the dominant plant form. And you can see there that those individual tree canopies are gen generally going to overlap and interlink, and they often form that uh, continuous canopy, which is what gives us that shade to, to varying degrees. Uh, just remember as we go through tonight that woodlands are not only going to be trees, although that's primarily what we are going to speak to tonight. And just to kind of set the stage, some of you have probably seen this slide, but just keep this in, uh, in your mind as we move through the next several slides. Uh, when we talk about the Appalachian region, we're talking about some 6,400 plant species that have been documented. Scientists think there's five or six times that, that many, so that's, that's a pretty big wow factor. Um, our mountains are going to be known for lots of different plants depending on which area, which region we're coming from. Uh, we're going to talk about the azaleas and rhododendrons. What I don't have mentioned here is the spruce fir forest. We're not even really going to go into detail with those tonight, but of course those um, spruce and balsam fir are what we're going to see um, over elevations of about 5,500 foot. Uh, many of you have joined with us in some of our wildflower talks uh, since March, so some of those are also going to be in these woodland uh, categories. And of course you can see their goldenrod, asters, those are blooming quite beautifully right now. But to really frame in uh, for tonight's conversation, we have to rewind uh, many, many years. And I'm just gonna kind of pick out one period here, 7,500 to 5,500 BC, um, what is considered the uh, archaic period. Uh, so when we have, um, we have proof, scientific proof from archaeologists, geologists, and, and such that um, many of these plant species existed. Uh, we can see that from acorns and hickory nuts. Uh, we see a lot of utilization of both our forest resources and on the forest edge. Uh, the seeds, berries, and nuts of some 20 plant species have been found in those early archaic sites, which really helped shape um, this region. And we kind of touched on that a couple weeks ago. So, we're going to take a little bit closer look at some of those 20 uh, plant species, but again, just to kind of give you an intro there. Um, we also know some of this because rock shelter sites were discovered uh, from northern Alabama all the way to eastern Kentucky. And you can see the remains there of many of the deer, um, beaver, turtle, and all of those carcasses. So we know that there was butchering and hunting going on years ago. So uh, Smoky Mountains, that area is generally known for 
flint working, we can see woodworking, hide working, butchering, all of that. We have evidence to support that as well. Um, if we really look at the Little Tennessee Valley, then you can see new technologies made their appearance at this time. Um, a lot of um, hearth, red clay hearths in that area we have seen. And from that area, we know that that's probably where some of our early um, basketry and weaving actually was first documented in the United States. So if, if you read your agenda, you'll notice that I started out with these uh, 20 species and maybe some of you were questioning why I didn't have oak and hickory on there. I'm not sure what happened, but it got cut off. But we're gonna kind of start about some, or start talking about some of these species. And I apologize, that picture is a little blurry, but if anybody's trying to get a picture of a white oak tree in all its glory, it's hard to do because they are uh, so big and quite majestic. Um, but the white oak, which is Quercus alba, it does belong to the beech tree, but the difference is going to be the bark. You'll see that when we get to beech in a little, in a little while. Uh, but these white oaks were known for living hundreds of years. Uh, there's even documentation that some have lived up to 450 years old. Uh, we call it white um, oak because of the color of the bark, uh, which is often that gray color. But once you cut inside, then you're going to see that white color. Um, also, if anybody saw the Shawshank Redemption, because again, I'm kind of on that horror movie thing, but that is one of my favorite movies. But in the last 10 minutes of Shawshank, there's a big tree that looks very similar to this. It's no longer standing, it has fallen, but it was about a 200 uh, year old wide oak tree, and they actually referred to it as the Shawshank tree. Uh, so you can see here from the acorns that years ago they provided a, a great food source for human and wildlife alike. Uh, the cool thing about the white oak is that the acorns are not, not quite as bitter as the red oak trees are. So um, Indians would use these to grind into flour. They used them for multiple um, medicinal uses as well. But again, as far as the tannins in the white oak, uh, they're much um, less bitter. Uh, they what we call um, astringent. So uh, white oak was actually used for a multitude of tools like our axe handles, uh, corn pounding mortars, baskets, and, and barrels. It was the Native Americans that first discovered that white oak is non-porous and it holds water. So that's one of the unique qualities of the white oak tree. Uh, they would use the oak though to um, cure leather and utilize it as a dye. We would be remiss if we didn't talk about um, a couple of important industries here in the U.S. Um, as far as our wine and whiskey uh, because federal legislation actually dictates that for it to have bourbon on the name it has to be aged in a white oak barrel uh, and it has to be charred. You can actually see that there. Uh, wine is often aged in oak which imparts those tannins but it's a white oak because they don't use red oak because again the white oak doesn't leave that bitter taste. It's a more mellow taste than the red, um, the red oak is. Um, banjos also have a history there with a the white oak. Uh, this is a white lotus. It was a 40th anniversary banjo made from Deering Banjo Company. So the unique thing about that is that the white oak projects a little bit better tone, uh, even more so than maple, which uh, many banjos are made out of today. Another cool feature with the white oaks, if anybody has ever seen these walking on the trail, um, these are actually tree markers. Uh, the Indians would do this deliberately uh, to let other Indians know which way to go for different things. So um, we could probably spend an entire class on that, but I put a link in your notes so when you get the presentation for tonight, if you're curious about how they use these trail markers, uh, make sure you look that up. There's a really cool history there um, on that. Our next specimen is the red oak tree, and there is a little bit of difference between our northern and southern red oak. Um, the southern red oak here is also known as the Spanish oak. Now we do have the live oaks that are so majestic in, in the coastal areas where the Spanish moss grows, but um, ironically uh, this tree is just known as the Spanish oak. Not to say that the Spanish moss can't grow on these, but not, uh, not as prevalently as the, the live oaks. Uh, the wood of the red oak is going to be really heavy and strong, but it's not going to be as strong as the northern red oak. That's what kind of sets it apart. So um, you're not going to see a lot of uses for that set southern red oak as much 
uh, just because of its durability. Um, as far as the red oak though, it does take to glue much better and takes a stain and a finish much better, which is one reason people prefer that in woodworking. Uh, you can see the picture there, it does look um, very different, the acorns do from the, the white oak. Uh, you can see that they're a little bit smaller, um, which could lend itself to the higher tannin, and more bitter content as well, but they're still a, a very uh, important food source um, for wildlife, especially deer and black, uh, black bears. And uh, again, the Indians would utilize uh, the acorns for just a variety of, of ailments. And that's gonna be one thing that we'll focus on um, in a few weeks. You can see uh, the bark there. The thing about southern red oak is that it does have a high heat value when you burn it, so it makes an excellent fuel wood. And then um, the bark is actually used to help cure leather from the tannins. Uh, this is our hickory uh, tree. Hickories are actually in the walnut family. This is a picture of a bitternut hickory, just to be a little bit more specific. And many of you have heard me say repeatedly um, something about the, the oak hickory forest, and that's the reason that oak, oak and hickory, that's a hard one to say, oaks and hickories uh, constituted over half of our forest uh, years ago. Um, we also use these trees as an indicator for soil, because chestnuts and most of your oak trees, they don't like a limestone-based soil. So hickories would predominate or pretty much be in those areas more so than our oaks and chestnuts. So kind of like we talk about weeds being an indicator of soil pH and what kind of soil you have, trees actually uh, serve that same person. Or, yeah. So hickory derives from the Algonquin language, which actually means a uh, poker chicory. And then there's actually ways that they can press the hickory to actually get like a hickory milk out of it. So uh, similar to some of those nut milks that you purchase in the grocery store today. You can see the nut there, what that looks like. And as far as the wood, it's gonna be really stiff, dense, and shock resistant. Um, there are woods that are going to be stronger and actually more dense than the hickory, but it's just that com combination that gives it the full durability, and that's why this is going to be one of the most prevalent commercial wood timbers that we're going to see. A lot of our everyday items are going to be made from hickory, so if you're a drummer, uh, the drumsticks are going to be made from hickory. Um, if you're a golfer, those uh, golf club, um, what are those called? I can't think what those are called. The shafts of the golf clubs are actually going to be made from hickory. Uh, one of my favorites is those paddles that they used to use in um, elementary school to spank you with when you were bad. Uh, those are also made out of hickory. So I can attest to the fact that hickory is a very strong and dense wood and make you walk sideways for a couple of days after you get busted by one of those. But um, years ago, they would also make baseball bats out of hickory. And we're starting to kind of trend back that way because ash took the place uh, for baseball bats. But now with the emerald ash borer, we're starting to see a comeback with hickories. Um, even early um, aircraft was made with hickory trees. Um, they also will use a uh, syrup, much like maple syrup, from the shagbark hickory. So um, maybe a few of you have, on here have traveled with us to Monticello during the Heritage Harvest Fest, and I was fortunate enough to pick up some of that a few years ago and actually have discovered I, I kind of like that hickory syrup, but even maybe a little bit better than, than, than the maple. Uh, the Cherokee would utilize this tree to make a green dye, and they would, uh, of course, dye cloth with that. If they mixed it with maple bark, it would yield a yellow dye that was a little bit brighter than any of the other trees would give them a natural yellow dye. Um, they would also utilize this in soap making because it would throw off a, a really strong um, lye or potash. It's excellent for uh, wood burning stoves and chimeneas. It's also a great uh, flavor to meat and to barbecue. You see a lot of that, especially um, here in the South, very popular for that as well as curing meats. And you can see the picture there, that's a shagbark hickory. 
there's about 200 different species of butterflies and moths that uh, actually will feast on hickories. A lot of people don't realize that they are actually uh, considered a pollinator plant for those specimens. And of course, back years ago, it served as a pretty tremendous mast food for the wildlife as well. Uh, one thing about hickory is that the root system is not going to tend toward um, lifting up sidewalks and things, so you'll see a lot of those trees um, in cities or urban parks. Okay, so the American beech, uh, this is quite a stately tree in our southern forest. This is Fagus grandifolia, of course Fagus is Latin for beech, and then grandiflora means uh, large leaf. A really unique seed on the beech, uh, the beech tree, the beech nut. It's the beech bark of a tree is very distinctive uh, because it's going to be that really smooth gray. And if you feel these uh, leaves are going to be papery thin, and you'll note that they're hairless. Uh, a lot of folks will get these confused with birch trees, but one sure way besides the fruit to be able to distinguish is they like that wintergreen scent. And of course, you know, a lot of people will chew on birch, which is going to be one of those we talk about in a few weeks, but um, a beech is not going to be quite as flavorful as what we would get with with a beech. I don't know if you can see this right here, but the bud is another pretty clear indicator. They're a really sharp pointed bud, whereas some of our other tree specimens have that um, more rounded bud. You can see the nut inside the husk here. Um, it, it does have a pretty unique history as, as far as, um, I guess, looking at the Anglo-Saxon vocabulary because the word for book, which is bulk, B-O-K, actually means beech tree. Um, there, there were actually uh, stories of pagan druid priests that would ra uh, write sacred symbols called runes on thin tablets that were made from the beech wood. And then those later were our, our first books that were documented. And you can see the nut there, so you can tell that it would take quite a while to um, get a pretty good harvest of the beech nuts. They are edible, um, but they're going to be uh, kind of finicky, and we'll talk to that in just a second. But the other cool thing before I forget, um, the John C. Brown Collection of North Carolina Folklore says that beech trees are never struck by lightning and they will actually protect you from lightning. Now, I'm not going to go put this, you know, theory to test, but that's just a little uh, folklore, and there's a link in your notes if you want to read more about that. Um, if you're going to harvest these little critters, the best way to do that is to harvest them before they fall, um, because once they start falling, they're going to be really hard to shuck out of that shell, and they're so much smaller than any of our other nut species. Some of y'all have heard me talk about some plants that are persnickety or they're temperamental. Uh, well, a beech tree is going to fall into that category. Um, where I grew up in Western North Carolina in my mom's front yard was a humongous beech tree. It's probably still one of my favorite trees on the planet. Uh, but it was very temperamental. There would be years that uh, the tree would not even produce. It would not throw off any of these you know, nuts. It was just crazy. And then there would be years you would get a really great harvest. Um, all these little seed, seeds or nuts would be even. But then you had other years that they would be very uh, disproportionate and distorted and um, not very meaty. And you can kind of see that from that picture here. And the other uh, unique attribute to a beech tree is that uh, the leaves are really bright yellow this time of year, but then they do this. They turn to that tannish color and they'll cling to the tree throughout the winter months. This is where I really miss interaction because I would be asking you as I move to a new plant what y'all think this is. But this one here is a hazelnut, uh, Coriolis americana. This is a tree that's gonna produce like a thicket forming area. Um, and it's gonna be one of those that you can plant to kind of naturalize a woodland area because it's not gonna get that big. It does provide some pretty cool interest because these male flowers that emerge in the spring, which we call catkins, are kind of cool looking. And then when we start looking at the, the nut formation, the actual hazelnut, they're enclosed in this fairly little husk, and we are seeing those now, September to October. And the kernel of that is actually gonna be um, used raw or roasted or ground into a paste. 
and you can see what that kind of looks like there. So if you're trying to draw uh, bird populations in, be aware that blue jays absolutely love these, as do woodpeckers, but blue jays, if you're um, feeding the other birds, you know, blue jays can be a little bit mean. So be careful with that if you put these in a landscape. Uh, the cool thing about hazelnuts is that they're gonna be used in those confections. Uh, so think anything chocolate, chocolate truffle, uh, think about Cadbury chocolate, they're gonna use um, hazelnuts just like Nutella and, um, Frangelica liqueur is going to be flavored with these. You can press the hazelnuts into an oil. Um, Turkey does this. A lot of the Middle Eastern countries will utilize that hazelnut oil because they are so high in protein and monosaturated uh, fats. And you can kind of see what they're, they look like there. They're also called a cob nut. Uh, they're also called filberts, and sometimes they're just referred to as hazels, depending on, on where you grow up. And there's about 15 different species of these. And um, they are in the birch family. You can kind of tell there in the fall what they look like, uh, why they would be related to the birch. All right, next up, um, this, is, this is probably one of my favorite trees, even though I hate the, the fruit. I'm not a big black walnut fan because very uh, bitter fruit. I think it's kind of like a uh, cilantro either you like it or you don't it's going to taste weird to some people uh, but black walnut's going to be considered one of the most valuable trees in our um, entire Appalachian forest you know it's going to have a myriad of uh, food medicinal lumber and folklore uses um, it has been here in North America for years it was one of the first trees ever documented uh, back in the archaic period um, the Native Americans found uses for these, as did the immigrants, and then of course the settlers as they came into the area. The Pennsylvania Dutch uh, would uh, seek out the areas for black walnuts because they felt like it, they could put their roots down where a grove of black walnuts were because they knew that the land was rich in minerals and uh, would provide for them good crops throughout the years. Uh, folklore will tell you that. Um, walnuts are best if you beat them to death and many people think that comes from where the, well back in the day you had to harvest them by literally beating them out of the tree uh, with a stick so of course uh, back when the, the first settlers started arriving in the area there was uh, monumental stands of these trees so they used them for uh, building split rail fences um, and houses as well uh, you can see the, the fruit there. It's going to be a, a rich brown color in the heartwood. And again, it's one of the most valuable trees in our um, native Appalachian uh, mountains. Um, it's known today um, as being utilized in uh, cabinetry, uh, wood floors, uh, various furniture. Again, it's going to be one of those that's going to take to a stain and a, and a varnish very well. It's going to be easily glued. Um, it's used most prevalently in the dulcimers throughout the Appalachian region. Uh, the other wood for that would be cherry, but uh, most of your dulcimers are going to be made out of black walnuts. Of course, we're starting to see a reduction in these stands, uh, but the cool thing about black walnuts is as, as an important timber crop as they are, they're, they're poisonous. Uh, they're a very toxic um, tree. And the reason for that, many of you have heard me talk about this before, but that alleliopathic effect um, from the roots, you know, we always say never plant tomatoes or your garden next to a uh, black walnut. Or if you're composting, make sure not to add uh, any debris from a black walnut to that compost bin because it does emit a chemical called juglone. And it's basically, a, it's a defense mechanism in that tree um, that it, it kind of signals to other plants to go away. Um, it wants to be in an area all by itself. So again, this is one of the earliest documentations from like 77 common era that, that we know that this tree released that chemical and it was um, documented as even being utilized as, a her as an herbicide years ago. Uh, you can see the fruit there. Um, actually, the name um, Juglans means nut of Jupiter. 
in Latin. So um, many people think that that actually refers to Jupiter's nether regions, and that's why they call it the glands of Jupiter. So um, if you know about the walnut, there's a lot of connection with fertility and love and a lot of legends. And uh, so a lot of people would carry a walnut with them um, to increase fertility. Uh, the Romans kind of took a different approach to the black walnut. They actually ascribed to the more feminine aspects of the walnut and, and associated it more with Juno, uh, Jupiter's wife, and she was the goddess of marriage and, and women. So um, I hope nobody wants to plan a Roman wedding because their custom, you know, where here in, a, in the U.S. we throw rice or bird seed or even those bubbles or whatever in... Um, Back in years ago, in the, the Romans would throw walnuts at uh, the bride and groom as, as they left because they thought it would increase their fertility. So to me, that sounds dangerous, and I'm glad I didn't get married during that time. Um, walnuts were said to draw lightning. So if you ever planted a black walnut close to your house, you were said to be crazy. Um, but a lot of experts say that that goes back to uh, years ago when uh, the incessant dropping of the walnuts on the roof of the house, uh, they thought that it drew lightning. Um, chestnut tree, we would be remiss uh, to not talk about chestnut. Uh, this was one of the, well, if not the biggest lost in our um, eastern forest um, at the turn of the century. Um, you, you just can't say enough about this tree and there are um, there is some research being conducted now to try to revive this tree but it's going to take a while to get us back to where we we ever were. 25% uh, of Western North Carolina's tree stand was chestnut um, at one time in those in those forest land. Um, it was um, also going to be found where all of your oak and hickory trees were. It just provided um, a very dependable food source. So more so than any of the other nut trees that we've talked about tonight, uh, not only for the wildlife, but also as the settlers moved in, it was a great livestock feed for, um, you know, for the cows and the pigs. There's also stories that I can even remember as a young child because, um, bear and possum, you know, all of that stuff was eaten or, like I said, these were fed to the pigs. So old timers would say that once the chestnut tree declined that the bears and the hogs didn't taste as good because they were lacking this um, in their diet. The other cool thing about chestnut trees is really what they give back. You know, we, we talk about cover crops and how a lot of those um, nitrogen fixing covers like clover, clover and um, vetch or lagoons and they fix nitrogen back in the soil well tr um, trees can do that same thing so a chestnut tree they were very important important to soil development because through nitrogen and far um i can't talk tonight y'all and potassium leaves could recycle about 24 pounds of nitrogen and 10 pounds of potassium per acre just on these uh, the other cool thing about chestnuts is that passenger pigeons would eat these. And then of course their droppings would help fertilize the soil as well. Uh, the native people love this tree. Of course, um, and I'll show you a picture here in a minute of what that hu hu um, husk looks like because it's very sharp. But um, anywhere that the chestnut tree was, they knew that that was good hunting grounds. And again, it was good food uh, for them as well. You can see what that looks like. I uh, my grandparents had two of these trees in their yard and I can remember getting off the school bus and they had this figured out. Um, they would pay us, me and my cousin, he was three years older than me, to uh, collect these off the ground. So these had fallen on the ground, we'd go out there and pick up nuts, well, you know, they were pretty much getting free labor. They didn't have to worry about all that stuff, but I love to collect chestnuts in the fall. It's such a great, great memory. Um, the chestnut was also going to be one of those first trees as the settlers come in. So again, they used that to make shingles uh, because they discovered early on that it was rot resistant wood, which is another thing that really set this tree apart from some of the others. Uh, they would make fence posts. Uh, they would frame their houses in. So lots of different uses 
for the, the chestnut. The other biggie was the chestnut commons. Some of you may have heard of that because it was a great way to provide a supplemental income for some of our, our mountain folks. So um, they would sell those for secondary income and then these commons were places where they would come in and thin those chestnuts out and any sharecroppers or any poor people that didn't have a lot of land could bring their livestock in to feast on those chestnuts. It was kind of a communal uh, grazing ground, if you will. And just another picture there to show you what that was or what they look like. Um, the blight came into a New York City zoo in 1904 and pretty much decimated the entire chestnut population. It moved south at a pretty rapid rate. Um, and within 30 or 40 years, the entire chestnut tree population was devastated. All right, next up we have hackberry, and I try to get a close up here so you can see that bark because this is one tree that you can identify just by looking at those little uh, warts on the, on the tree. Got these little wart-like protuberances all the way up. Uh, the wood is gonna be a really light yellow. It's coarse grained, it's heavy, it's strong, it's, uh, it's, it rots very easily, so it's not gonna be one of those important to the timber industry at all. Um, the hackberry gets confused with a lot of different plants, uh, sugarberry being one of those, but oftentimes that's gonna be a habitat thing. You're gonna see that more prevalent in the north. Uh, these are the pea-sized berries that the hackberry uh, will throw off. Uh, these are going to be really high in calories from uh, fat uh, versus some of our other berries and nuts. So um, this was used often by Native Americans as a flavoring uh, for meat. This is the mighty persimmon. We're starting to see a comeback with this fruit. This is one we're going to spend a little time on uh, when we talk about edible landscapes in more detail. Uh, but this is a native tree to the, to the southeast. Um, females are going to produce this fruit. That's a little fleshy orange brown fruit. You just got to be careful when you harvest these because if you harvest too early, they'll really make you pucker. They're pretty, pretty sour. Uh, you can't get a native persimmon really easily though in um, nurseries. They don't stock those, so you got to be real careful where you, where you uh, purchase or acquire one of those. So again, this is the time of year that persimmons are going to be ripening. Um, they're really sweet, pulpy fruit. Uh, but if, if you like these, you've got a narrow window because everything from a fox, squirrel, and raccoon to a coyote um, are going to eat these and they'll often beat you to them. Um, this, the Cherokee Indians were the first people to introduce persimmon sweetbread. So this is one of those fruits that uh, went back to England uh, pretty early on in the, in the 1600s. Uh, people even make an ice cream topping out of persimmons. It's used in puddings and cakes, cookies, all kinds of different things. And there's actually um, some recipes in the PowerPoint. So make sure if you want to re research some more on the persimmon. Um, you can actually roast the seeds um, of the persimmon and get a coffee-like flavor. Um, again, it's just going to be a little bit more bitter than traditional coffee. Um, I put this plant in here, it was mentioned, and I don't know a lot about this plant, so I did this kind of on, um, on purpose. So if anybody has some uh, familiarity with this plant, feel free to share that in the chat box and we'll share that with everyone. But this is called copper leaf or copper plant. It's also called three-seeded mercury. Uh, mercury for the, for the god, not the metal. Um, but it's in the spurge family and most people actually call this a weed, but this is one that I'm not familiar with. I've never seen this. So I'm going to do some more research on this, but again, if anybody's familiar with it, make sure you share that knowledge. Um, here's one that we're probably all familiar with and maybe most of us don't really care too much for, but this is a pigweed in the amaranthus family. Uh, most of us really battle this in our gardens and of course there's uh, many different kinds. So um, I did kind of want to approach it from a different perspective, I guess, because um, most of us in, in the South hate this weed so much. But just to kind of make you aware, it's going to be one of those plants that grows really well in, in the desert and arid conditions. So our Native Americans in the Southwest um, 
really depended on this plant. So when they would put their crops out, the, the corn and beans, they would depend on this as a vegetable and actually considered it a vegetable to get on through until their beans and corn uh, was harvested. And then they would actually roll up the leaves and bake those and store them for the winter months um, to, to basically get them through. And of course they use um, still today the young leaves um, as a green, um, just like we do some of our, well, I'm going to talk about poke here in just in a few minutes. If you ever travel to Mexico, you're, you're very liable to get a confection of this. They make a candy there uh, with the pigweed and actually mix it with, with honey. So still, still utilizing this today. Um, pokeweed, Probably many of you in the Southern Appalachians are going to know this as poke salad, but this is one of those that you got to be really careful with because it is a very toxic plant. So there's some directions on how to cook this plant um, in the notes if you so choose. But this is actually considered a, um, a staple in Southern Appalachian cooking, although farmers are going to look at it and say that it's very much a weed. And of course, it's poisonous to us, the seeds are, but uh, not to the birds. So that's one reason that we uh, see these plants popping up everywhere. Um, another plant, maybe some of you might be confused on. Uh, we've had this discussion a few times in some of our other gardening classes, but sumac is not always a bad thing. Many people relate it to being poison sumac, so it is going to be in the same family, uh, but this plant's also going to be in the same family as cashews and pistachios and some of those other toxic plants, and we're going to talk about cashews later in one of our other classes, but uh, the cool thing about sumac is that um, before we knew what lemons were, this was used to impart that lemony tang to a lot of uh, meat and seafood dishes. So it was actually considered um, an excellent spice for that purpose. Plus it yields a really pretty red color in, in foods. Um, Middle Eastern uh, countries still utilize this quite extensively. These little berries here that you see are actually called droops. So they would actually uh, use those for rubs and meat marinades. So very similar to a raspberry, how these little droops are formed. So again, there's some uh, recipes that are included in there, just some traditional Southern Appalachian um, cooking. Um, the Native Americans utilize this plant quite extensively. Um, everything medicinal use that you can think of, especially um, for midwifery. Um, it was a nursing aid uh, for mothers. It does have a pretty um, varied multicultural history. Uh, this is one of those plants that even though it's native here, it, it, spans, um, it spans the globe pretty much. It's utilized in many different countries. And also it's gonna be used as a really pretty um, dye for um, Moroccan leather. And here's the wild grapevine. I get a lot of questions on this each year because I think we're starting to see uh, more and more occurrences of this. It, um, it is invasive because of its really woody uh, root system. It can persist for quite a long time. So even folks that do go after this weed with uh, glyphosate have to make multiple attempts to try to control this. It's really tough to eradicate. Uh, and I wish I'd put a picture in here of, uh, in the Smokies, there's lots of hidden places that you can find the, the swinging grapevines. Um, as a kid, I can remember doing that in multiple locations on the Catalo Catalucci side of the Great Smokies. So some of those great big grapevines still do exist. Uh, the one thing about these that kind of sets them apart from their cultivated counterpart is that they can uh, sustain higher elevations and lower temperatures than our modern uh, grapes do. And you can see, well, I can't see that because I think there's a tendril over here somewhere. Um, those tendrils are quite steadfast. Once they grip something, they pretty much can go anywhere. So that was just a snapshot of some of those first plants that really uh, helped shape our Appalachian region, specifically our woodland species. So I hope that gives you a little bit of an introduction. Um, you know, maybe uh, the next time you're hiking out on a trail, you can identify some of those and be like, wow, you know, I hope, I hope you have some historical rebel, uh, relevance as to why they're so important to our area. 
So I wanted to talk about a, a few more species here too, and just to kind of reiterate that um, plant collecting kind of added to our human impact on the land through seed dispersal. So people would carry away um, foods from the parent plants, and sometimes that would be into new habitats, or sometimes that would be into new hunting grounds, but whatever, they would have disturbed soil, and that's that's where a lot of weed species uh, later emerge. But as a result, we also had an increased range um, for plants that actually fed both humans and wildlife and livestock later on as those populations came into the Appalachians. Um, this is another time I wish we could be interactive because I would ask y'all what this is. Um, in my native Western North Carolina, we call this Sarbus berry. So I remember the first time I ever saw you know, or seen this spelled out, it was service, and I thought, well, they've spelled that wrong. That's not how you spell it. Um, but this is the service berry. Um, you're going to hear it called multiple things depending on what part of the Appalachian region you're from. Uh, but service berry actually got its name because back in the early pioneer days, you know, we would have those freezing cold winters, so um, we didn't have the circuit rider preachers out delivering the message on Sunday, but it was when they would see the service berry in bloom that they, that's when they started preaching again and going from town to town. Uh, the other reason it's called service or service berry is because um, they couldn't dig graves in the winter. So if anybody passed away during the winter months, they would actually allow those bodies to freeze. And then when the service berry was in bloom, then they would, they knew that they could dig graves and, and actually bury the dead at that time. Uh, you'll also hear this plant called Juneberry, and that's just because of, of when it's becoming ripe in June. Um, if you're up, I think Maya's on here from Maryland, so up in the New England states, you'll hear it called Shadberry, because that's when the shad are running in certain streams, and that was about the time that the tree bloomed. Um, it is a member of the rose family. You might be able to tell that from right here. Uh, but you'll also hear this called Saskatoon berry, so it's going to reach um, even up into uh, Canada, and actually uh, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan was named um, because of the multitude of uh, Sarvis berries there. And of course, one, one of our probably uh, most favorite trees in the spring, because it does in fact signal that spring is here. It may also signal um, another winter, Little winter is on the way, our, our uh, red bud winter, but this is Circus canadensis. Um, it is a legume, some people don't realize that, um, but in some parts of the country you're going to hear this referred to as spicewood, and this doesn't give you a really good picture, but um, in the spring when those twigs are green they would utilize that to be able to cook really gamey meats like bear and possum again, so you'll hear it hear it called spicewood sometimes. Uh, Native Americans would actually eat the flowers. They would roast the seeds and eat those. And we're going to talk about the phytochemistry of herbs in um, about a month, but um, anthocyanins are really heavy in redbud leaves, and a lot of our wild foragers will still utilize those. Uh, you can always tell a redbud by that heart-shaped leaf. Uh, the unique thing about the red bud is that it's going to put out its flowers first and then the heart-shaped foliage comes later. And many of you have probably heard the story about it also be, being called the red bud Judas tree or just the Judas tree. And that's because it was said that Judas Iscariot hanged himself from a branch of, um, the, of a red bud tree. It was a different species. It was Circus siliquastrum instead of the Circus canadensis, but um, basically in that same family. It, it does have a really good uh, grain for a wood. It's, it's a really strong wood, but because it's so small in stature and because it, you know, it doesn't grow straight and it's kind of wobbledy gook when it grows, it's not a really good timber tree. It could be, but, um, you know, as the legend says, when uh, Judas hung himself, that's why uh, the tree is so short in stature, but they don't use it for a commercial tree. It's going to be used predominantly in landscapes. Uh, next up, we have the state tree of Tennessee, which is the tulip poplar or the yellow, pop, uh, yellow poplar, just poplar, a lot of different names. Uh, we just don't want to get it confused with, with the real poplar. But um, this is one that we're going to see very predominant in um, the Great Smoky Mountains and those cove 
hardwood forest and the coves that you've heard me talk about. It's going to be really fast growing. You can see there from that trunk just how straight up that it that it grows. Um, you're going to see it starting to bloom in April, so it's going to be one of those first showy trees that we get to or flowers that we get to see. It's also the state tree of Indiana and Kentucky. And it serves as a really nice muse for poets and even Edgar Allan Poe, if any of you are fans, his short story called The Gold Bug uh, was written about uh, the tulip poplar. A lot of wood carvers will also use this tree. Um, you can probably tell by this picture that it is a member of the Magnolia family. Uh, the Algonquins are what gave us the name for this tulip tree. Guincentia uh, was the name for many years. Uh, the other cool thing about the poplars, many of you have probably seen uh, the dugout canoes that they would hollow out of a poplar trunk. So settlers uh, west of the Appalachians would actually call this tree canoe wood. Uh, sometimes it's also referred to as white wood because the bark um, and the, or the heartwood is so white. Um, just a little fact here, um, when we did talk about the Appalachian Range, you know, extending all the way from Newfoundland down to Alabama, but the cool thing about this tulip tree is try to picture that area from um, Pennsylvania all the way to Georgia because that's where about 75% of all of our yellow poplar exists. So huge popular or popular poplar destination, uh, you know, for, for the Southern Appalachians. It's a pretty cheap uh, tree to grow. Um, it's going to be really resilient because it grows in pretty much any soil too. If you ever are in a church and hear the organs playing, most of the time those organs are gonna be made out of poplar uh, because that wood is a little bit more pliable, but it would also help seal against those valves and um, everything a little bit, the fusion was a little bit better than some of the other woods. When you think about yellow poplar, most people will compare it to white pine as far as durability and um, stain and color and all of that. All right, here's another legume. You can probably tell there by looking at it, but this is our black locust. Um, it's often referred to as false acacia or acacia, depending on how you say that, um, but it's not in that family at all. It actually is in a subfamily of the mimosa, which you can probably all also tell by looking at that picture. Uh, this tree was first identified in the Jamestown colony in 1607, and that was where it actually got its name. They, from, um, I think they called it Old World Locust. Uh, Jesuit uh, missionaries fancied that um, this tree was what supported St. John in the wilderness, but it's only native to North America, so there's some question there. Uh, this tree is actually extensively, even still today, planted for firewood. Uh, it's going to grow rapidly pretty much in any soil, but when you cut this tree down, it's going to re-sprout from its stump. Uh, from that existing root system. So for some people, uh, that's why they consider this an invasive species as well. So just keep that in mind. If you hack this down, it's going to come come right back. But ironically enough, people will plant this black, uh, black locust on um, the streets in Europe and in their urban parks and, and things over there. Um, here's a good picture to show you that it is a legume. You can actually eat the seeds within the pods there. You can see what that leaf structure look like. Um, they will actually uh, use this in Romania to make a really perfumey, really super sweet jam. Uh, you wouldn't think that to look at it, um, but it is highly aromatic when it's used to, to make any, any kind of jam or anything. Um, the, the bark leaves and wood are going to be toxic to humans and livestock and that's because of glucosides and that's going to be a term again you're going to learn in a couple of weeks. I kind of wish I'd have done that class first but um, if horses ever eat any part of this tree then um, it's probably one of those instances you want to be calling the vet pretty quick. This is a good picture to show you what that wood does look like. It's extremely hard. It's going to be one of the hardest woods in North America, it's going to be uh, rot resistant. It's very durable. It's used in furniture. It's used in paneling, fence posts, and even small watercraft. Uh, the thing is, when you first plane this wood, 
it stinks really, really bad. Uh, it emits a very foul odor, uh, but once that wood is seasoned, that smell um, dissipates immediately. Uh, you'll still use black locust in some of our handrail systems, uh, some of those within the park like in Gatlinburg, some of the outdoorsy type stores you'll see that used um, quite a bit. It is uh, valued for a firewood again, it's going to burn really slow. You're not going to have a lot of flame, you're not going to have a lot of smoke with this, and even if this wood is wet, it's going to burn. So if you plan on going camping, like a group of us did a, a couple of weeks ago, then you want to have this wood with you because it never stopped raining. So it's a good one to have on hand uh, for that purpose. All right, so now we're gonna kind of shift gears a little bit and move into three of our really common species um, in, in the mountains. And those are the rhododendrons, the mountain laurels, and the azaleas. So just to kind of, I guess maybe, differentiate between the three. They're all in the Heath family or Ericaceae family. Uh, so are blueberries and cranberries. They're just all in a different genus. There's going to be thousands of different cultivars of rhododendrons, but remember that all azaleas are botanically rhododendrons. So that's one reason that we have so many of those cultivars. So although they're used interchangeably, mountain laurel and rhododendrons are not the same plant. And a lot of people don't realize that. The other cool thing about um, in, the, in the mountains and still today with the old language, uh, rhododendron is called laurel, but then the laurel is called ivy. So sometimes you're going to hear rhododendrons called mountain laurel and you're going to hear mountain laurel called mountain ivy. Um, and again, that's just the, the old names. We use them interchangeably all the time, but just to kind of show you the difference, we've got uh, the mountain laurel here. It's going to be evergreen, sh uh, sharp, shiny leaves, whereas the roadies are going to have a little bit dull, leathery leaf surface, uh, not going to be quite as green as its counterpart. Um, let's see, a laurel flower is going to re resemble like a tiny cup or bowl, and the rhododendron blossoms, of course, are going to be really big. Again, those old names are still used today. So if you hear a mountain ivy, we're not talking English ivy or Virginia creeper. Uh, we're talking about mountain laurel, but a lot of people are still going to call that rhododendron. Uh, the name I prefer to call um, all of those are the laurel hills. And um, some of you may have heard stories of the laurel hills because it's mainly a jumble um, of all of these, whether it's the rhododendron, the mountain laurel, and the azaleas, or a combination of one or more, when they mass together, um, you basically have to swim through them. Um, I, I've actually been in places on the bald back home where I've had to remove my backpack and actually slide on my belly to get through some of these laurel hills. I'll give a shout out to my sister who got us lost on the mountain, but anyway, that's another story for another day. But um, these really truly do exist. Uh, there's not a, really a legend there. Um, this is a true story about Huggins Hill, which is um, off Mount LeConte. If you're ever hiking up um, the Alum Cave Trail, you'll see a sign for Huggins Hill. Uh, that ridge line is going to extend all the way over into North Carolina, close to Fontana, like Forney Creek area. So different areas along the way that uh, is referred to as the hill. So if you like that story, there's a, there's a link in there that you can go and read. It's pretty cool. He basically got lost in the, in the hills for three days um, and just basically went around in a square mile for that length of time because it's almost impossible to get out of. Uh, here's a picture of the Catawba rhododendron. This is pretty prevalent here in the southern Appalachians. So they're going to bloom um, sometime in June, depending on elevation, of course. As we uh, escalate in elevation, they're a little bit later to flower. Uh, this is the Rose Bay rhododendron. So it's actually going to bloom a little bit later than the Catawbas. Uh, this is one reason that uh, name is used interchangeably with the Mount Laurel because of the color of that flower. If you think about anywhere in the Great Smokies or even out of the Smokies in our Cherokee and Pisgah National Forest, and it's probably true uh, with a lot of our other uh, national forests, you hear the name Laurel quite frequently. Laurel Falls, Laurel Cove, Laurel Creek, Laurel Branch. Um, all of those, again, are referring to that old name for which we call uh, the rhododendrons.
but here's a picture of the true mountain laurel. So a little bit smaller in stature, but you can tell if those get massed up, you're gonna have a hard time getting through that. Many different uh, species of azalea. This is uh, one of the flame azalea up on Grandfather Mountain. Um, if, you're, if you ever have the opportunity to go up there, it's really beautiful to see in June um, into early July. And then just to talk about a few more species, uh, because remember that our woodland species are not just trees. I want to talk just a few minutes about some of our uh, forest floor plants. So this is the jack of the pulpit. The cool thing about a jack is if we ever get an insect down in the female of the plant, it can never escape. It's almost like a Venus flytrap, if you will. So um, that's just cool little tidbit about those. Uh, we call these pretty predominantly jack in the pulpit or just plain jacks, um, but other uh, regions of the Appalachians will call them wild turnip or Indian turnip, um, even wake robins, um, a bog onion, or um, a brown dragon. But this is one of our native species, and this is what we're seeing right now, um, the berries uh, from this plant, which is one of the reasons that it's so unique. So just a quick story on on the jacks. Uh, the, the Native Americans would actually harvest this co uh, corn and they would chop it up and mix it with meat and then they would leave that out for their enemies to consume. So it was uh, what they referred to as a deceptive weapon uh, with dire consequences. Uh, so you wouldn't really taste the corn of the jack but uh, consuming it raw, it would uh, leave you uncomfortable at best. It would, um, it's full of calcium oxalate, so if anybody's ever had kidney stones as a result of oxalate crystals, then you know what I'm talking about. Uh, you get that burning sensation. It's one of those that basically with this starts in the mouth and it works its way through the body, so you can imagine um, how painful that that could, could be. However, if you, if you dry and cook this plant, um, it can actually be eaten as a root vegetable. You just really want to know what you're doing in that regard. This is gonna be an early uh, specimen, well, late spring, uh, that you're gonna see this plant pretty prevalently, uh, especially anywhere that there's a creek. Uh, Solomon still really uh, likes those moist, damp conditions. But we have uh, Solomon seal, which is what you see here, and then we have false Solomon seal. Um, I tend to lump them all together, but there is a pretty distinct difference. You can see the flowers here on the real Solomon seal that kind of dangles from uh, the bottom of that plant. And you can probably tell by looking at it that it is in um, the lily family. You can actually use the rhizome um, as a food and the Chinese, this is huge in China, um, in Eastern medicine. Um, they will, they, they consider it a magical herb and they use it for a lot of different things, but they'll actually um, use it in wine and liquor for um, flavoring. So if you're interested in learning more about the Solomon seal, there's a link in there with that. Uh, this is the false Solomon seal, so you can tell the difference there in the flower structure. Uh, this one's gonna be um, above the spikes rather than below. And then you can see what the fruit's gonna look like. This is the false Solomon seal. So you're not gonna see that with the true Solomon seal. It's gonna be more leaves and the flowers on the underside. Um, here's one of my favorites. This is black cohosh. Sometimes you'll hear it called a uh, skunk plant. And just an FYI, all of these notes are in the PowerPoint, complete with the Latin name. So you'll make sure you know specifically which cultivar I'm talking about um, with our native species and all this. Uh, but black cohosh is um, a really showy plant. You can tell here it's an upright uh, perennial, so even the foliage is pretty cool, but then it starts throwing off those flower spikes, and that's where uh, that smell comes from. Now, if you have a large amount of deer population, they don't like the foliage of black cohosh, but they will tend to nibble on the flower spikes. So just to make you aware of that, and you can kind of see what those flower spikes look like. And very similar to black cohosh is the blue cohosh. And again, we're going to talk about some of these differences as far as medicinal uses and things later on um, in the next few weeks. But blue cohosh is not going to be quite as big um, as the black, and it's actually going to yield a uh, yellow flower. 
And the really cool thing about blue cohosh is that um, when the leaves first start emerging in the springtime, they're going to be dark brown before they turn green, which is kind of weird. And then you have those yellow flowers that appear um, before the plant completely turns green. If it's a pollinated blue cohosh, then um, it'll throw off these really cool little berries. Um, it's not going to be one of those plants that you're likely to notice you know, hiking on a trail. It's just not one of those showy flowers unless you are lucky enough to, to see the fruit. And actually, these berries are actually the seed um, of the plant. And again, even today, uh, rheumatism is what the blue cohosh is touted for. But you can kind of see what that flower looks like. And just more pictures of the berry there. Uh, this is a really unique plant. This is called baneberry or here in this region we refer to it as doll's eyes. It's going to look really similar as far as the foliage to uh, black cohosh, but the flower is going to be different. I call these little puff balls versus um, the, the spike. But the cool thing about doll's eyes is the name of the plant, the doll's eyes. So you actually get these little berries. Uh, you don't want to be consuming those berries though because they are uh, toxic. Um, they can actually even cause cardiac arrest. Again, it's not one of those plants that's gonna to be toxic to birds, um, but this is not gonna be one of those that make the edible list. Uh, we have to talk about Virginia creeper. This is notorious in the South. Um, I, I'm not gonna compare it to uh, kudzu at all, but you can kind of see how this, is just a carpet of creeper. Uh, so it can be a, a really beautiful ground cover and if you're trying to hide something but it can disrupt a lot of plants growing just because it's disrupting photosynthesis so you have to be really careful with that it uh, pretty much can climb on anything uh, the really cool thing about creeper is it does grow very well in the shade and that's where it's going to be predominantly found in a setting like this but if it gets any sunshine then it's going to throw off a great red color this time of year in the fall. It's just absolutely um, gorgeous. I think I have a picture. Yeah, you can see that just starting to, to turn there. Um, a lot of folks will get this confused with poison ivy, but the difference here is that this is um, quinquefolia is the Latin name, which means five. So you can tell here that we have five leaves on this plant, whereas poison ivy is going to have three. Um, also, a lot of folks will get this confused with um, heterohelix, um, English ivy, um, not anything remotely similar to um, the English ivy. The, probably the biggest thing to, to really touch on with Virginia creeper is if this is something you're trying to eradicate, don't go and just peel this off the side of a building or a wall. Uh, make sure you cut that at the base first and after a couple of days when that plant starts dying, it will release these little, I call them feet, um, automatically and you won't have any scars um, to that surface. But if you try to do that first, um, it's not going to want to, to leave where it's at. You can kind of see how those are like glue on that tree there. Here's another favorite um, in the springtime. It's going to be one that emerges really quickly, um, but this is about all you're going to get. It, it is a member of the lily family, and, but the flowers, you just don't even really notice the flower. And actually, anybody that's grazing in pastures where these come up, they can be very toxic to uh, livestock. I've seen a lot of occurrences with um, goats and sheep and cattle having trouble trouble with this, but this is the false hellebore. Um, it's got a few other names, tickleweed, itchweed, devil's bite, uh, poor Annie. I'm not sure what the, what the historical context is by, by some of those names, but the thing that I can say, it's got those alkaloids that can be very detrimental to, to livestock, so have to be careful with that. This is one that's a lot of fun. I call it the opposite of the evening primrose. They're not in the same family at all. This is actually a spiderwort, but the spiderwort is going to bloom in the morning. So if you want to see its showy flowers, you've got to get out and up and out pretty early because then they disappear by, by afternoon. Um, 
differences on how this name or how this plant got its name some say it's because of the, the leaf structure it kind of looks like a spider but then some people say that um, when you cut it open it oozes out and it's real stringy and it looks like a spider web so um, kind of de depends on who you talk to we're going to spend some more time and one of the other classes talking about warts uh, w-o-r-t uh, because we have so many of those in the Appalachians, our toothwort and motherwort, uh, spiderwort. But basically, wort is an old English word, and that means herb. So that's, that's basically all we're saying with those words or warts. Uh, just a few more to think about that's really um, prevalent in our Appalachians are ramps, of course. Um, these are um, native to here. We even have folks that have their little patches here and there, um, and it's a secret. You know, people really covet their ramp hideaways. Uh, but the reason that they're so important is they're, they're kind of like a, a wild onion, but um, as, and they've got a very pleasant, sweet taste, but they, they do stay with you for a couple of days. Uh, but anyway, uh, this was one of the first plants to emerge in the springtime, so it was actually uh, considered a tonic and was considered to help with scurvy and some of those nutritional deficiencies after a long winter. So uh, the settlers and the Indians both love to be able to um, eat ramps just, just for that reason. Uh, you're going to see these growing in any of those forests that are under the trees of any of those, um, well, the trees that we first talked about, the oaks, the hickories, um, walnuts, anywhere that we see those trees dominate, then we know that's a good rich area for these ramps to be growing. So if you're trying to get your own ramp patch started at home, you want to make sure you have a, an environment that's going to be conducive to grow those. And just a few pictures there to show you what the colonies look like. Um, you can see that red stem. Now these have been harvested whole. Um, if you're trying to preserve the wild ramps, uh, we say cut the leaf and actually leave the bulb because it will keep spreading and you'll have ramps for years to come and the, and the leaves are going to taste just the same as uh, the bulb itself. As you can see there is a pretty huge colony of ramps. One of the Southern Appalachians most uh, revered plants, you know, there's even um, festivals named after this. Uh, the ramp festivals in Newport, Tennessee, Waynesville, North Carolina. Uh, there may be um, others, but um, ramp festivals pretty pretty well dominate the South and, and are a big, uh, you know, multiple ways to be able to cook these. Rampant eggs, uh, rampant potatoes, so a true Appalachian delicacy. Another delicacy would be uh, the ostrich fern or the fiddlehead. Now I say ostrich fern because the true fiddlehead that, that we eat, that we talk about, that is so yummy and tastes like asparagus or spinach, you know, sauteed in the springtime, um, it is harvested from the ostrich fern because we have some that are, um, that try to be fiddlehead ferns and they are not. Um, so just be careful with that if you're, if you're wild foraging. But again, um, they've got a short window in the springtime. You see how they emerge. Um, they're called fiddleheads because of a, a bass guitar, a doghouse bass. That's kind of what that, that looks like. But they do have that really nice spring grassy um, flavor. Um, if you want to preserve these, um, you can freeze them. You just want to blanch them first and then freeze them in a single layer and then bag them up or whatever. But uh, when you go to cook them out of the freezer, don't thaw them. Um, take them directly from the freezer and boil them or steam them um, because otherwise they're just going to be really limp and not have any texture and even flavor. A lot of people also pickle the fiddleheads. Um, here's a favorite. If you're lucky enough to see this hiking somewhere, then you've really seen a cool specimen. Um, I've only seen this one place on the trail, and well, it's not even on the trail, it was in Valley Cruces, North Carolina, but this is a, what we call Indian Pops. You can see that flower head is actually bent down, um, but it's solid white, which means that it doesn't need, it doesn't use photosynthesis. It's not needed at all. Um, it feeds on a fungus, 
and that fungus in turn is feeding on the roots of trees so it's one of those things don't you just love how evolution works so each one of these little stems is going to carry that one white flower uh, they will become erect later in the season but again it's a narrow window uh, the cool thing about these is that they even add winter interest because once they're um, I don't know if you, I don't know if we say frozen or whatever but anyway wherever these pop up they'll just dry to a brown but they'll still maintain the same stature and those seed heads will actually persist through the winter months and then um, our um, native orchids and there's so many of these um, I just put this one in here because this is one that you're going to hear me talk about in future classes in the coming weeks. But uh, this is the pink lady slipper or the moccasin flower. Um, it's one that's being poached pretty frequently. And, you know, we've often said if you're lucky enough to see this, don't take a picture and put it on Facebook and let everybody else know where they're at because um, they, they are being poached at such a high rate. Uh, these things are actually called scapes, much like garlic. So they truly don't have a. Uh, flower per se uh, but the native americans really made use of all of these native orchids each one of these uh, served a pretty specific purpose um, i will tell you too if you're interested in the name there's a there's a big story about that and you can read that but i think in essence of time i'm going to skip on through that but uh, truly these native orchids are some of our most prized plants um, in the appalachians so now just to close us out, I uh, just wanted to give you a sneak peek, kind of a primer for what's coming up in, in the next um, six weeks or so. But these are all going to be considered woodland species, but like I say, we're going to reserve some um, explanation for them later. But uh, ginseng, or what we call sang, uh, this is a good supplemental income if you're lucky enough to, to get a patch of this started. Um, this is one, again, that's being heavily poached out of our native regions. It's actually being uh, commercially um, grown as well because it is in such high demand in the Asian market. So you can sell a pound of this for, and dried pound, not, which is much different um, than just digging it and selling it, but it's going to be about 300 to $500 a pound, depending on where you're selling. Uh, the big thing with ginseng is that you want to make sure it's the, the Panax quinquefolius, not that Korean ginseng, and we're going to talk about the differences of those um, in a later class. Golden seal, often where uh, you see ginseng, you're going to see, um, oh, this, I'm still on ginseng, Anna, sorry. Eh, there's a little bit of difference between the American and the Korean. And you're going to see both of these um, in the in the Appalachian, but this is going to be our native species here. I had more pictures of that than I thought. Okay, so here's another one, uh, golden seal. And like I say, often when you see sane, you're going to see golden seal too. Uh, pretty cool little plant because that flower uh, yields the berries that look like they're on top of the, uh, the leaf, which is really cool. So uh, this is actually a member of the butternut, I mean buttercup family. Sometimes you'll hear this called orange root, and sometimes you'll hear it called yellow pecoon uh, in some of our New England states. Native Americans love this plant. Uh, for so many ailments, it was used for treatment of a multitude of things. Still used today, it's touted for its um, immune, uh, building the immune system, um, all kinds of skin ailments. It's used as a dye and insect repellent, so multiple uses for this plant. Uh, Bloodroot or sanguinaria, this is another one that uh, is pretty cool, and I'm going to show you more pictures in a couple weeks, but how and why it actually got its name. It does have that bloody looking stem, which is really cool, uh, but this is one that, again, used pretty prevalent um, in Native American culture. Uh, they often said that, you know, whatever the plant yielded was what it was used for, for so blood root or sanguinaria uh, was actually used for blood type diseases and it's a member of the poppy family um, another one is the jewel weed or our wild um, impatience or touch me nots um, we have orange that pretty well is prevalent in the 
Southern Appalachians, uh, we do see the yellow from time to time, but this is going to be more predominantly in the New England states. But um, it's often said where you see poison ivy growing, that jewelweed will be pretty close by because, again, it's that uh, relationship that the plants are actually smarter than we are. But jewelweed is a great um, antidote, if you will, for uh, poison ivy. And of course, our echinacea uh, touted for inflammation. Um, yarrow that we see growing in our woodlands uh, is known for blood clotting uses. Many different species of Monarda exist in the Southern Appalachians with multiple uses. Um, you're gonna hear this called a lot of different things, Oswego tea, uh, Min Monarda, bee balm, uh, lots of different names for that. Um, it's going to be used in everything for inflammation and building your immune system to teas and dyes. So pretty cool little plant. Um, this is a mint plant. Um, mountain mint. And it, well, and I've got the, this is mintha piperita um, because some people call mountain mint not what you see here. It just depends on what region you're from, but um, we do see the mountain mint growing wild. It's a little bit different. You can see the color structure there. The leaves are going to be a little bit thinner, and I will actually try to put, um, I need to write a note, to put that publication in there. It's where you can differentiate. And it's kind of like the Mount Laurel rhododendron and azalea. Multiple names. Um, doesn't mean that any is wrong per se, just as long as you're kind of keeping it botanically to, to the Latin. Um, May apple is going to be to use um, used to cure warts. This is one that's coming along as quite the little, uh, well, I guess it gets a blue ribbon because we're starting to see it used more in cancer treatments, chemotherapy treatments. Um, not to say that chemotherapy drugs are all natural, but um, you're starting to see this used a lot more frequent, frequently in some of our more modern medication. So a lot of multiple uses for some of these forest floor plants. And you can see there that it was used as a laxative. Um, that was one of its first uses. But people uh, still harvest uh, the apples and make the May apple um, jelly. And like I say, uh, for wart removal, it's an excellent, um, it has an excellent use for that. And again, you're gonna see these plants a little bit later on and we'll delve more into those. Uh, last, I just wanted to mention uh, the rubus species are our wild blackberries and wild uh, raspberries. Of course, those uh, were just a delicacy to have back in the day with the, the Native Americans and when the settlers first started arriving. Um, raspberries considered a very nourishing herb, especially for, um, again, midwifery, uh, childbirth. It was utilized as a, as a great tonic uh, for healing. Uh, the roots, pretty much all parts of this plant are actually very useful, useful and we're going to speak to more of that um, in, the, in the coming weeks. But with that, that's going to wrap us up for our woodland plant species. And I hope I've piqued your interest just enough to join us back next week and we're going to delve more into some of our other native species. Some of them I've talked a little bit on tonight and um, Again, like I say, you're going to see them either next week or you'll see them during edibles. Uh, we're just going to kind of get tag team on each one of these um, Monday night classes. So I haven't seen any questions or anything like that because I can't see that chat box. But as always, I'll go through there and pull those comments and pull those questions. We'll get those answered and we'll send that out to all of you uh, tomorrow. So everybody will have access to that. And all of this stuff will be in the Google Drive. So if you want a copy of the PowerPoint with all the notes that I talked about tonight, just request access to that Google Drive because you're gonna get an email from me in the morning with that link and just go to class 22, I think. And as always, this will be recorded. And that will also be uplinked too. So I'll send you an email when all that occurs. So thank y'all for joining. I appreciate y'all for hanging in there. And we will see you next week.